uh, but uh, you get you get the third string today. Uh, Greg, first string is uh, he and Tori have gone out to La Mesa to be with uh, uh, her uh, dad, and it's the first anniversary since her mom her mom just just passed away a year ago, and then uh, the Blues are all sick this morning, so I I come in third so. You're stuck with me this morning. So let's go to Lord in prayer, and then we'll just take a few minutes and just talk about a few things uh, concerning the Lord this morning. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for caring for us and dealing with us, even though we, we don't deserve it. We just uh, praise you for all that you uh, are going to do. We praise you for what you've already done. And I pray that you would just uh, speak through me the words that you have for us today, that we would just uh, learn and be able to uh, comprehend what you have for us in the future. We love you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> I think uh, probably most most everyone in here, maybe not all of you, have heard uh, of my story recently and how that uh, after being in the ministry for, for a lot of years, uh, chose to uh, uh, quit pastoring a church and, and go into, the, go into to being a missionary. And I've always had that desire, always had that little bit of a tingle in the, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the back of my heart, in the back of my mind that just wanted to do mission work. And so got the opportunity. God gave me that opportunity. And in 2011, uh, we resigned our, our, resigned our church and moved here to Granbury and uh, was, a mis- was a missionary sent out of Granbury Baptist Church. And... Uh, then we were we were working with Mana Worldwide, which most of you know, uh, we f- support a feeding center through Mana Worldwide with the Bickles, and so God gave me that opportunity for several years, and then due to some health constraints and with my wife, myself as well, just chose to uh, to uh, make another change in life, and uh, so fortunately for us, and uh, you'll. F- uh, whether or not you feel like it's fortunate or not, God brought us to uh, <laughs> to uh, pecan, and uh, we're just having a good time serving the Lord right here, and uh, enjoying uh, what we're doing here. But I've always had that little uh, tingle, that little uh, every time a missionary comes around, I just get uh, I get emotional. Every time I think about missionaries, every time I think about what they go through on a day-to-day basis. Some of my best friends in this world are uh, the missionary friends that I've made as pastoring, got to know them as a pastor, uh, got to go visit them on the, on, the, on the mission field and see them in their work environment. Uh, those some of, are some of the best friends I've got in this world today is those that, that are still uh, on the field, still serving, still doing. And so uh, it's just one of those things in my life that I love to talk about. And so I'm going to take a little bit of Judy's thunder this morning. I'm going to talk a little bit about missions this morning. Our church does such a fantastic job with missions. And I hope that you guys are all involved with missions. You know, it's, it's easy to do. It's kind of, you kind of have to think about it, have to work on it. It's, it's a part of your pocketbook. You know, you got to kind of make plans to do it. But uh, our church supports uh, 70 some odd missionaries through through uh, us and through E3, the organization through uh, Granbury Baptist. We we support 70 some odd missionaries through them, and then we support how many missionaries of our own, Judy? Five missionaries that we support of our own as well. And so, uh, we're you know, if you're used to an independent Baptist way of doing things, where everything is you know it's 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 a little bit different. But our church just uh, thrives with what we're doing, and it, and it fits us very, very well. And I'm grateful that our, uh, we have that opportunity to do that. And it's grateful that we can look at things. But in the last few years, a, lot, a long time ago, I heard a story uh, about, I mean, uh, about the orange groves, the parable of the orange groves. I don't know if any of you have heard it. Maybe if I, when I start reading it here in a minute, you'll recognize it. But it impacted me a lot when I was in high school, and I really just fell in love with the story. And every time I would remember it, every time I would bring it back up 
or find it where I had written it down or where I'd put it in my Bible somewhere and read, read it again. It just made another, another spark in my mind. Well, I was, uh, when, uh, <clears throat> when, Matt, when Matt called yesterday to say that they were, he was supposed to be teaching this morning, when he called to say that he was, was sick and wasn't going to be able to be here, uh, I did, went, to my, went to my desk, op- turned on my computer, and started looking at some of the, I got to try to save as many of my old sermons and old teaching notes as I could. And uh, one of the things that popped up was Parable of the Orange Grove. And so as I began to read it, I began to just get a little teary-eyed again just because of the impact, remembering and recalling the impact that it's made on my life in the few times that I had a chance to read it. And so if you don't mind and would would like, uh, I would like to read that to you this morning and it's it's about six or seven minutes long if I read straight through but just talking about and the impact and what it says so this is called uh, the parable of the orange grove it says I dreamed I drove down a lonely road straight long and empty on either side were groves of orange trees row after row stretching back endlessly from the road with with bows of heavy round orange fruit it was a harvest time and fruit was abundant. My wonderment grew as, my, as a mile slipped by. How would the harvest be gathered? During all the hours I had driven, seldom had I seen another person. The groves were empty of people with only an occasional orange picker here and there. However, far from the highway on the distant horizon, lost in the vast wilderness of this unpicked fruit, I could, I could discern a tiny group of them working together diligently. And many miles later, I saw one more group. It seemed an impossible task for the few scattered pickers. As fruit fell steadily from the trees, it seemed as though the earth was shaking with silent laughter at the hopelessness of the task. Shadows were lengthening when, without warning, the road curved, and sharply there was a sign that said, Leaving neglected country, entering home country. The contrast was truly startling people were everywhere and traffic was heavy the orange trees were still there with oranges in abundance but there were orchards were filled with the multitudes of people who were happy and singing and in great contrast to the silence in the groves which I had just driven through I parked my car and mingled with the crowd people were all were all in their expensive suits fancy dresses shiny shoes and showy hats everyone seemed so bright and fresh it was a contrast to the old work clothes I had was that I was wearing is it a holiday I asked a well-dressed woman who whom I fell in step with she startled she looked startled and then her eyes fell in condensation you're a stranger here aren't you (laughs) Uh, before I could reply she went on this is orange day she must have seen my look but continued proudly, it is good to turn aside from one's labors and pick oranges one day of the week. But don't you pick oranges every day, I ask? Oh, yes, one must be ready to pick oranges always, but Orange Day is the specific day we set aside to do it. I noticed that most of the people were carrying a book beautifully bound in leather, edged in gold, and entitled Orange Picker's Manual. Around one of the orange trees, uh, seats had been arranged in tiers, and they were almost full. A well-dressed man conducted me to a seat and gave me an orange picker's program. There were a great number of people gathering. One man up front began talking to the people, and soon they began to sing. The songbook was called Songs of the Orange Groves, and everyone sang, Shall we gather all the oranges? The man in front admonished us to sing louder. I was puzzled. When do we start picking oranges? I inquired of the man who shared the songbook with me. Oh, it's not long now, he told me. We like to get everyone warmed up first. Besides, we want to make the oranges feel right at home. I thought he was joking. After a while, a a rather well-dressed man read two sentences from a well-worn copy of the Orange Picker's Manual and began to make a speech. I wasn't quite sure if he was talking to the people or to the oranges. 
I looked around and saw a number of similar groups gathered around other orange trees here and there, being addressed by what seemed to be a professional picker. Still, other trees had no one around them, no one to pick fruit from them. Which trees do we pick from? I asked the man beside me. He didn't seem to understand, so I pointed to the loaded trees all around us. He said, well, this is our tree, he emphasized. But there are too many of us to pick from just one tree, I protested. They said, there's too many of us just to pick from one tree. There are many more people than oranges. We don't all, we don't all pick oranges, the man patiently explained. We haven't been called. That's the head orange picker's job. Here we're, we're here to support him. Besides, we haven't been to manual school. There's a lot to learn about oranges. Besides, you need to know how an orange thinks before you can pick it successfully. Orange uh, uh, psychology, you know. So what's manual school, I whispered. Well, it's where they go to study the orange picker's manual, my informant went on. It takes years to understand it, and even more years of personal training. I see. Uh, I had no idea that picking oranges was so difficult. The man in front was still making his speech. His face was red, and he seemed indignant about some of the other orange pickers' rival groups. Uh, but then a glow came on his face. But we are not forsaken, he said. We have much to be thankful for. Why, just in the last 12 months, we have seen three oranges brought into the baskets. And I'm sure you'll be happy to know that we are now debt-free, having paid off all the new cushion, cushions that you're sitting on. Isn't it wonderful, the man next to me murmured. I, have, I made no reply. I felt that something must be profoundly wrong somewhere. All this, all this seemed to be a very roundabout way of picking oranges. Oh, where did it go? I'm missing something. Sorry. To to continue to uh, read his story, he reached up in the oranges and plucked one of them from the branches and placed it in a basket at his feet. The applause was deafening. Now, do we get to start picking oranges, I asked the informant. What do you think we're doing, he hissed. Didn't you see those two oranges that were just picked? What do you think this tremendous effort has been made for? Why, thousands of dollars have been spent on the tree you're looking at, and there's more orange-picking talent in this group than the rest of the home country combined, he bragged. I apologize quickly. I don't want to be critical. The man in front of me must be an excellent orange picker, but certainly the rest of us could try picking too. There are so many oranges that need picking. we got hands. Surely we can read the manual. Son, when you've done business as long as... You as I have, you'll realize that it's not that simple, he replied. This, there isn't time. We have work to do, houses to look for, houses to look after, families to care for, besides grooming the trees around, besides grooming the grounds around this tree. We, we, but he, he, I wasn't listening. Light began to dawn on me. Whatever these people were, they were not orange pickers. Orange picking was some form of weekend activity reserved for a few. I visited a few more of the other groups. Not all had such high academic standards, but some did hold classes on orange picking. I tried to tell them this, uh, of the trees that I had seen in the neglected country, but no one showed any interest. We haven't even picked all the oranges here yet, was their usual reply. The sun was setting as I drove back along that lonely road on which I had come. All around me were those same vast, empty orange groves. But there had been something, some changes. Everywhere the ground was littered with fallen fruit. It seemed as though the trees had rained oranges to the ground, and now they lay there rotting. I said to myself, no man cares for these oranges. I, I contemplated all the people back in home country. Then booming through the trees, there came a voice saying from Matthew chapter 8, excuse me, Matthew chapter 9. It says, the harvest truly is plenteous. But the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. I then awakened and I found that I was only dreaming. You know, there's a lot of, uh, 
a lot of truth in the story. It's a lot of things that we could, we could almost point to us, <laughs> point to ourselves as finding uh, a problem with and seeing ourselves in this. <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 9, in verse number 35, you have that verse. Matthew 9, 35 says, Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, when he saw the crowds of these people in all of these villages and all of these sin and then in the synagogues where he was, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into the fields. I think if we're not careful today, we can find ourselves just like the, the home, the group of orange pickers around that in, the, in, in home country. And we will forget and neglect those around us. We'll forget and neglect those fields that far, that far out stretch all around the world. Uh, can we do it? Yeah, we can. We can go out. We can be workers. We can be uh, the ones who go out and, and visit and work and, and bring more oranges <laughs> uh, into the church. We can be the ones that pick that fruit. Can we? It's 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 just doing the simple. It's just doing the simple things. It's doing the small and striving to see it through and taking the time to pray and to study and to understand what God wants for us in our lives. To live this purposeful life, to live this life of purpose, of the life of uh, accomplishing something that he wants us to accomplish. Being that witness, being that one who goes out, the harvest, the workers in the harvest. You know, there's not a whole lot of, uh, that needs to be, I, I tell, used to tell people, would I, I, uh, heard the story and, and have had people call me and say, I need you to come and, and, and witness to this friend of mine. I need you to come and do this. Well, can, are you, without trying to be condescending to them, have you not accepted Christ as your, yes. Well, can you not tell them just the story of how you accepted Christ? Can you not just go through that, go through those steps and understand and allow them, and allow them to hear what you've done and what you happened in your life? Every one of us is capable of, of leading someone to the Lord. It's, the, it's getting us out there and getting us before people. And even those friends of us, that friends of ours that we have in our lives, can, we can do that. Can we do it? We, yes, we can do it. Uh, will it work? Yes, we can work at it. We can work at what it would do. We believe in the Lord's pr promise that when those, when that seed is 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 put out there, that that seed will come back. That we can have that uh, promise in our life. Do we believe the Holy Spirit lives within us and will guide us and direct us? Is it worth it? Is it worth it? <clears throat> Recognize God's love for everyone it's recognizing that god doesn't love just us who are here in the home country but he he loves even those that are in the neglected country he loves all of us god loves each and every one of us and wants to us to be faithful in reaching the world around us a few years ago i had the opportunity to be uh, on a trip before I was even with Manna. And some of you may have heard me tell this story before. But we went to a particular feeding center that was a Manna feeding center in Panama and uh, went and got a chance to meet and greet and just be with the kids and, and a, a took, took a bunch of pictures. And uh, a few years later, about seven years late, I met this little little girl, seven years old, eight years old, about seven or eight years later, I'm now working for Manna. I happened to go back to that same feeding center. Well, that same young lady was not any more help, was not any more a little young, little seven or eight-year-old girl. She's now 14, 15 years old. 
And guess who is helping with the feeding center? Guess who is helping to feed the kids? Guess who is uh, almost ready to graduate high school? Guess who is going into the ministry as a result of some people taking the opportunity and ministering to that little girl when she had nothing? When she had absolutely nothing, they, she was found on the street. Her and her brothers were begging for food. And a, and a pastor took the opportunity to, there in a, a missionary took the opportunity to speak to her. One of my, I, I love hearing and seeing and, and knowing stories like that of people who have accepted the call, accepted the 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 call of Jesus Christ to be a, a, a worker in the harvest. Does anybody know what January the 8th, 1956, what happened on that day? 65 years ago last week. January the 8th, 1965. On January the 8th, 1965, five young men flew there flew a Nate Saints airplane onto a sandbar in a river down in Ecuador I believe it was Ecuador it's down in South America and for two or three days they had witnessed to and tried to talk to the uh, to the Indians there and on January the 8th 1956 they were overrun and killed and gave up gave their life for uh, what they thought was a was a cause that needed they the those Indians had never been reached no one had ever been able to talk to them no one had ever been able to reach out into their villages and they figured out a way to land that little plane on a sandbar and were trying to reach those people Jim Elliott Pete Fleming Ed McCauley Nate Saint and Roger Yodarian if you haven't read the book, I remember reading it as a, as a young man in high school. Uh, Elizabeth Elliot, Jim's, Jim's wife, wrote Through Gates of Splendor. You ought to read Through Gates of Splendor. She also wrote a secondary book called Shadow of the Almighty. Uh, you, ought to read, you ought to read those, those books. Very, very interesting read. Gives a lot of details as to what was going through the minds of those young men and, and the reason they were there uh, and the reason what they were, why they were doing what they in, in fact, it wasn't uh, how many years ago, just a few years ago, five or six years ago, maybe, I don't my time goes, time gets all goes, runs together. There was a movie that was produced just a few years ago that was called End of the Spear. And it was more of Nate Saint's uh, story but it was it, it but it was a made for Hollywood movie called End End of the Spear. Very, very good movie that was made. Uh thought they did a very good job talking about and showing uh what some of what took place. They actually have some of the home footage of the cameras that were used uh, that they were using to reach. As I look at that and think of those things, it just reminds me. Uh, at times just how uh, comfortable we can be how uh, almost uh, just don't care you know just that attitude sometimes of we just don't care enough <clears throat> and I'm not trying to coerce you I'm not trying to shame you into doing something I just want you to think about how important it is that we get the gospel to the to the world around us how important it is it's 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 just as important for us to share the gospel to our next door neighbors it's just as important for us to share the gospel around the world to all the all the countries around the world to all the people who that we may not even know not have any contact with to continue to support those missionaries that we have in our in our church the reason we have and the reason we bring missionaries in the reason we talk about missions the reason we have a missions committee the reason that we uh, take up money for missions the reason that we have all of these things we go on mission trips 
uh, every year, with the exception of the last three years. <laughs> uh, uh, but we, the reason we do that is to get people to think, get you, get myself, continue to remind me of the need of what missions is about. And remind ourselves how important it is because Jesus said, even Jesus, when looking upon the crowd, says the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. The harvest is plenty. There's lots of harvest. Going back to the orange grove story, there's a lot of oranges. How many orange pickers are there really that are ready to pick the oranges? Pray the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into the harvest. I hope you have today, even maybe a little bit, maybe become a little bit more aware, a little think a little bit more about it. Judy, I didn't, even, I didn't even ask you, I didn't wonder about any of this. Do you have anything you want to add about our missions program? She's not really. You want to? Come on. No. <laughs> Um, praying for them yeah very good thought yes yes absolutely Jeannie thank you I, I didn't even completely skipped over that part but yes we do have cards available where it's monthly where we change our missionaries where we rotate them and we pray for them and i hope that you take advantage of that please pray for our missionaries all around the world everyone that's in in any, in any kind of harm's way and uh, i dare say uh, you know it's getting to the point now even here in the united states where it we're not in harm's way yet but it's looking like we could be at any moment you know and uh, anywhere you go outside of the United States of America, very few countries just give you full reign to just do whatever you want. So they're, they're in some type of harm's way, uh, harm's way. And so pray for them. Pray for them that God would just encourage them. Pray for them that they would be not just encouraged, but they would be uh, able and physically and spiritually uh, charged to the point of getting out and, and making those uh, differences in the lives of those people. One of the things that I, I noticed about most missionaries is they don't have, they don't, there's never a day off, so to speak. They have to be a missionary 24-7. Does that make sense? Sometimes we can take a day off and we'll walk around and we'll won't, we won't let anybody know that we're missionaries. We're just as much a missionary as they are, but we won't say anything. We won't talk to anybody if we get that chance. We won't interact with anybody about our uh, Christi Christian life, but it just doesn't seem like when you're, when you're there on the foreign mission field, it's like you've, you've you know, people are watching. <laughs> people are seeing what's going on. If you haven't seen it, uh, just just across from the men's restroom, there's a TV that uh, has got a rolling index of all of the pictures and rolling index of all the different missionaries that we support on any given basis. And if I'm not mistaken, Phil, and I'll probably have the numbers wrong, but somewhere around uh, 30, 30 to 33% of every, dime, of every dollar that came in last year went out into some form of missions. So we, we had $360,000 come in last year and a little over 30% of that went out into our missions. So, you know, we're, it's, God has blessed and God tremendously continues to bless our church. But I think it's because we are a mission-minded church. It's because we do think about this, the missionaries. And I just wanted to remind you that a little bit today. Um, whenever I get the chance to speak, and it's a real, it's a short notice. My my go-to is missions, <laughs> if that makes sense. 
Uh, it's just it's something that's always been on my heart. I've always talked about, always thought about, and uh, uh, made several trips when I was pastoring. Made several trips along through the through time. One of my one of my favorite missionaries in the world is uh, Gene Pettit uh, down in Old Mexico, and Gene just continues to go. He's he's almost eighty. He's seventy nine years old, and still on the field, still going, still just just trotting along, just continuing to do what God called him to do all those years ago as a young man uh, uh, when he was flying. Uh, that's how he, he first started off was flying uh, people back and forth in his little cub, his little cub plane uh, into Mex- in and out of Mexico and, and working with pl- flying missionaries, flying Bibles down and flying literature and stuff like that back and forth. And then... Uh, he got to where he couldn't do that as much, so then he just uh, scratched out on a piece of ground. And, and uh, I went down there one time with him, and we were in a, a little short bus, a little 14 passenger, wasn't a van, but it was a, it was a bus. And st- he and I stood up at the front. We sang a couple of songs together. There were six ladies in that in that bus that had come out. We just went around in the neighborhood, and he. He announced that we were going to have a little service, and we parked the bus on the side of the road, and, and about six or eight little uh, little ladies and some kids came out, and I stood up in the one end of the bus next to the steering wheel, kind of ducking my head just a little bit, and uh, he interpreted for me, and, and we had three ladies accept Christ, and I had a chance to go back to that area where he's worked at and saw all three of those ladies still in his church 10 years later uh, serving the Lord. So, I mean, you don't ever know who it is when you talk to them. You don't ever know who is going to accept, who is not. You don't know uh, if they're going to continue, if they're going to stay, if they're going to not. So that it just shows and tells me, proves to me that we just need to be about letting everyone know, speaking to everyone we come in contact with. Uh, uh, Nathan and I, almost every chance we get to, to work together, if we're going to somebody we've not ever met before, we, you know, you go to explaining who you are, what you've done, and, and you ought to see the eyebrows raise when I tell them that, you know, yeah, we, we, we go to Pecan, uh, Pecan Baptist Church. I'm the music director and associate pastor there, and he's on the, and it, you know, sometimes the, the, the language changes. <laughs> sometimes the whole demeanor of the, their face, you know, all changes. Uh, but then we get some interesting conversations after that. And uh, I think, you know, it's just uh, letting people know who you are and just being who we need to be when it comes to uh, uh, picking oranges, <laughs> being the right kind of servant that God wants us to be. And we're way early, but that's, that's my lesson today. Yes, Roy. Only on form for you. Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. Yes. Yes.
That's cool. That's wonderful, yeah. So when you think of uh, missionary commissions, you'd be so free about who you share with who you in that nation. Mm-hmm. Because to me, you trust your name, your it's their people there. Mm-hmm. And uh, yet there is warfare going on through the years of this war, of course, there are many people with press lines. Absolutely. Oh, it's not, yes. Yeah, it's not just where, you know, uh, even the story, going back to, this, to the little bit of a, the story, there were oranges where they were. There's oranges everywhere. There are people everywhere around us that need to know Jesus Christ. There are some areas that are more neglected than others, but it doesn't mean that we need to stop doing what we're doing right here. We just need to keep going and keep doing. And uh, just pray for those that are in the harvest everywhere that are preaching the gospel, teaching, and showing what Jesus Christ is really all about and letting in in his blood and what he did on the cross of Calvary for each and every one of us. All right, anybody else? Another comment? Thank you very much for putting up with Third String today. And uh, Chuck, would you dismiss us? Would you do that for me, please? Father, heaven, Lord, we want to thank you, Lord, for this chance that we can gather together, Lord, and worship you and look at your word. 